A special shout out of thanks to uh, the voice of the Miller Center, Ann Compton, who is here with us today and is the, the voice behind those um, two terrific videos. So as I said at the beginning today, uh, we're celebrating the release of a number of essays, in particular one by one of our panelists, which is on the mechanics of managing the federal government. It's actually a number of authors behind it at McKinsey, but um, uh, one of our guests today is the lead author of the piece. And the focus of this conversation is how should the president think about this first year in office as the CEO of, as you saw in the video, the largest employer in the world with four million employees. Um, we've got a terrific panel, and we have a terrific partner in putting on this event. And I'm going to uh, bring up Jeff Baum from the Annenberg Retreat at Sunnylands, who is the communications director there, as well as a senior fellow uh, at the Annenberg Center on Communications, Leadership, and Policy at the University of Southern California to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much, Bill. The Annenberg Foundation Trust at Sunnylands was established by Ambassadors Walter and Leonor Annenberg. Ambassador Annenberg served as the ambassador to the Court of St. James for President Nixon, and Leonor Annenberg served as the ambassador in chief of protocol for President Reagan. And the Annenbergs had a deep commitment to public service, and they, uh, in addition to his success in business, he was a billionaire publisher. They built a, an estate in Southern California called Sunnylands. It's a 200-acre estate near Palm Springs in Rancho Mirage with its own golf course and, and others and hosted presidents of the United States, starting with President Eisenhower in the late 60s. President Reagan famously spent every New Year's Eve there. President Nixon was a frequent guest, as were both President Bush's. And also in recent years, President Obama has discovered the magic of Sunnylands uh, and you'll see uh, in the sheet that you have, he has had six meetings there, including a, uh, uh, three summits, including with the President of China, the King of Jordan, and the leaders of the 10 ASEAN nations. That's to fulfill what the Annenbergs had hoped that Sunnylands would become a Camp David for the West Coast. And we are fortunate, I do need to call out David Eisenhower, the namesake of Camp David, and the grandson of President Eisenhower, who's with us here today as well as uh, Tweed Roosevelt, who's also a close friend of Sunnylands, and the great-grandson of President Theodore Roosevelt, who's here with us today, and he's president of the Roosevelt Foundation, and David is a colleague at the Annenberg School at the University of Pennsylvania. The, so it is, when we learned about the, when the Annenbergs do, passed on and left the estate and in a sizable endowment to continue that legacy of Sunnylands as a place where world leaders would continue to gather, the other top priority was for Sunnylands to help the President of the United States, the bipartisan leadership of Congress, the Cabinet, the Supreme Court, to work together to uh, work effectively to improve the effectiveness of the three branches of government. And when we learned about the Miller Center's first year project, we couldn't have been more enthusiastic about a more noble pursuit in uh, what's needed. We want to set aside the politics if you can. What's mo most important is what's going to happen after people get elected. And so we reached out to the Miller Center and said, would it be possible, is there any way we could support what you're doing to get our next administration off to a great start? And we are honored to be a partner and a supporter of the Miller Center in this effort and to bring you and these leaders together for an important conversation that we, help will we hope will continue throughout the course of the election and then help move us to the next stage of governance once the uh, new administration is elected. So it's our honor to be a partner in this effort and we look forward to continuing to partner in efforts such as this. The pa I, I'm not going to introduce the entire panel, but a, another great uh, partner in this effort is Fortune Magazine. And Alan Murray, as you know, is the head of Fortune in the newly named uh, chief content officer for Time Inc. And he's uh, involved with the Miller Center. His senior editor will be leading the conversation and also introducing each of the panelists. Dan Primack has been with Fortune for six years. He's worked in local, pre uh, in, in local news and, and runs uh, a lot of the most uh, insightful and uh, thoughtful coverage that Fortune is able to offer. 
So if you can please join me in inviting the rest of our panel to come up, uh, please welcome Dan Primek. I'll be very quick. I'm just going to introduce incredibly quickly the folks we have. Uh, these are four folks who have a variety of experiences, but I'm simply going to mention the one that's most relevant to us here today. Uh, so I'm going to call them up. Uh, please welcome Drew Erdman from McKinsey, who wrote the paper on CEO transition into presidency that you guys have today. Uh, former Governor Haley Barber. Uh, Senator from Tennessee, Bob Corker. And Clay Johnson, who helped uh, run personnel for the Bush-Cheney transition in 2000. Hey guys, thank you for coming. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. Uh, Drew, can I start with you? So, so you're the one that wrote the paper that hopefully folks got emailed to them that's sitting here talking about kind of what private CEO transitions can teach the next administration, next incoming president. Just quickly, why? What, why is this something you're working on? Uh, well, this is all in the spirit of obviously this is a recurring challenge. Uh, some transitions have gone well, some transitions have not gone well. Uh, but also we see that in the private sector and this is just in the spirit of we were pulling together some perspectives where we've invested a lot quite frankly a lot of time and energy in understanding the private sector transitions we advise a lot of CEOs we also do it in public sector and we thought that this would just be a great opportunity to pull together some of the insights that are relevant and quite frankly some of them are maybe not as relevant for the public sector and offer them for folks to discuss and debate Clay, you were involved in transition, uh, what, at this point, 16 years ago? I think I'm oh, yeah. 2016 years ago. Okay, there, there's always a lot of talk about the first 100 days. I, I'm sure we'll hear it on stage here. We'll hear it next week in Philadelphia. And I, I'm curious, what's more important during those first 100 days? Is it, is it setting a couple big legislative agendas, or is it really just getting all the people in place to then go and try to get that stuff done? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't have a choice. of You have to do all of the above well. Just a question of how much of all of the above. And um, the biggest challenge and the, most, the greatest distinction, I think, between a presidential transition and a corporate transition uh, is the corporate transition. Maybe you're going to bring four or five new people in to surround yourself, like-minded people. Uh, in the federal government, it's 4,000. And the, the old adage 2080 rule, probably 400 of those people are the key leadership you need. And, President so-and-so might need a different 400 than somebody else based on some, some things going on different at the time in the world or domestically or whatever. And right now, only about 220 of those people are in con confirmed and in place by the August recess. That's just not good enough. And uh, whether you started fast or slow, it's 220 because they don't, most people don't start ahead of time. And so anyway, it's getting your team in sure. place and, and so approach it very differently than anybody else has done it. And so that's a big challenge. And then it's it's you want to get your first one or two uh, legislative items, uh, international affair items, whatever, launched. Don't try to launch them all in the first year because you can't. You don't have enough people around you, uh, senior people in your team to do it. So you've got to show at least to everybody that's watching, which is everybody in the world, that you can walk pretty darn good. You can walk in an admirable fashion, and now you're ready in that second six months and beyond to really get after it. I'm curious, is it a mistake, uh, Governor, is it a mistake that, those, I guess it's those of us in the press, but I think it's, it's those in the political world too, focus so much on what is or isn't achieved in the first hundred days, when, as he said, you really are starting from not quite a dead stop, you've got two months, but you, know, you, don't, have your, you don't have your C team in place yet, they haven't been confirmed. Well, the truth is, in the federal government, that is a, you know, it's just a tradition. I remember we did contract with America, and Newt had the idea, we had to have 100 days right. just because that was the tradition. Didn't have a thing. Isn't to do. a bad tradition. Didn't have I a. I don't think so. But in state government, often there is a good reason. Like in in my state, the first legislative session lasts 125 days, <laughs> and the legislature meets annually. They don't come back till next year unless you call a special session. So there is a rationality there. But in the federal government, it's, it's purely tradition. Uh, I, my, my own view about about all this is, and maybe it's my experience, this all starts at a campaign. If you're going to be a new president, people ought to know what your agenda is when you get inaugurated. I mean, it, I, I ran my first campaign for governor and was elected. Uh, I'd never held state office, I'd never held public office. But in the campaign, we had very humbly Haley's <laughs> plan, and uh, <laughs> we had seven issues. And we decided three of the seven were going to be the top priority for, 
for the uh, first for the first session of the legislature, and everybody knew what it was. Everybody knew it was tort reform. Everybody knew it was getting control of the budget without raising taxes. Everybody knew it was in education destigmatizing workforce development and job training. And then improving and expanding it. I mean, and, and you have to destigmatize it because the, the teachers have made it a stigma if you don't go to the four year college. But at any rate, everybody knew that's what we were going to do, and legislators signed on or didn't. Senator, I'm curious for you, particularly given where you are, are there lessons, I guess, or, or tips you would tell the next president when it comes to getting folks through the confirmation process, particularly senior folks? Because as Clay said, you can have all the people who you want to have, but you still have you guys still have to say yes before any of them can actually go to work. Right. Um, sure. I mean, the process has been way too slow. Uh, we've eliminated a lot of the positions that used to have to be confirmed, which has been helpful. But, but no question. Uh, just to the broader question, I thought the paper that uh, Drew and others wrote was was good, and I just want to uh, just to allude to Haley's comments. One of the things both of the campaigns it think at this moment are lacking is laying out that clear agenda. Uh, we were talking in the car coming over and you know typically most politicians really try to enact the agenda that they run on and the public uh, supports them in a mandate and therefore they're able to do that and I think it's difficult to discern right now exactly what the agenda is on, on both campaigns. You've got a tone, you've got a feeling. So three things for me would be, again, to set that agenda during the campaign. Make sure people understand what it is you're going to do. Secondly, make sure you've got the people in place to do it. But thirdly, as it relates to confirmation and getting that agenda done, Washington is yearning for um, a, a president that will reach out and communicate and have conversation. I would begin doing that immediately so that you really soften things up in such a way and create the relationships well, where confirmations and where the agenda can take place in a you more speedy manner. So right now, and obviously we're at the GOP convention, you're a Republican. Do you think then the Clinton campaign right now should be reaching out to folks like you and having those conversations? No, not today. Okay. I'm just saying. All right, that's what you said. No, 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 I, I no. No, what I mean is I think that both of the campaigns, uh, I, I didn't mean that in a pejorative way in any sense. I think what they've got to do between now and Election Day is make sure the American people really understand and what life is going to be like if they're elected, what their agenda is going to be. Right now it's been about feelings. Um, it's, it's been about personality. It's been about competence. Uh, and I think that, uh, again, I have really no idea exactly what is going to take place after. So they got to build a case for that. But I do think Washington is ready for a president that uh, on both sides of the aisle does reach out and does so quickly and begins to, to build a relationship with people. It makes a lot of difference. I mean, you alluded to some people and somebody, Bill alluded to some films and people's success. A lot of their success had to do with the relationships that they had with people and, built, and they built that immediately when they came into office. Drew, you, you mentioned in the paper at one point, you used the term be bold. Uh, does, does that mean that for the incoming president, when we talk about these agenda items, that the first things they should go after are the most ambitious and, and that they should communicate and, and how they communicate that to their staff? No. Again, this is just one of those lessons that um, we have from looking at successful CEO transitions that it goes back to the kind of window of opportunities that uh, executives have. And that, again, this is an analogy from the private sector, but I think it is indicative in the public sector as well, which is uh, if you sit too long on things, you're not going to be able to form people's understanding. You're not going to be able to set the narrative. You're not going to be able to shape it. You're not going to be able to mobilize. And then you'll be basically a victim of events. And so that's you know empirically what we've seen when we look at uh, hundreds of CEO transitions is exactly that, which is those that are most successful are those that relatively rapidly come to a conclusion of where they want to take things, articulate it very clearly, and quite frankly make the tough calls relatively early on to generate the momentum they need because in a way um, in the private sector and arguably uh, I'll leave it to those who are more expert in the public sector, success can breed success if you get the ball moving. But if you're, but if you're stationary, that's not a good place to be. Governor, for you, you know, when you came in, with, you said Haley's plan. Was that what you, okay, Haley's plan. So, so when you came in, day, day one, you know, the, the inauguration's over, everybody's happy, everybody comes into work. Th this might sound really pragmatic and boring, but do you sit everybody down and say, look, this is, do you personally say, this is how we're going to do it, and, and this is kind of the general attitude I want toward it? 
Actually, during the transition, I did a lot of that. Okay. Uh, I, I, I succeeded a Democratic governor. I beat him uh, for in his reelection attempt. So I created a new administration. I had Democratic majorities in both houses of the legislature. A lot of people assume because you're from Mississippi and our presidential voting. Well, the Democrats had a 22-seat majority out of 122 members in the House, and uh, I never had a Republican majority in the House. The Senate, I had a Republican majority one year. So the last thing I wanted was a party line vote, okay? So I brought Democrats in, in the transition. Democratic legislators, committee chairs. Here's what we're gonna try to do. We didn't agree on everything, but I'm gonna tell you, you look at Bill Clinton, and you look at Ronald Reagan, and you understand a good executive can lead in divided government, but the president's gotta try. And that's a great failure that we have right now. The president's not trying to lead the rest of the government. Clay, for you, I'm wondering, you know, you, you just talked about bringing Democrats in, which is partially because you had a Democratic majority, but can you speak a little bit to the value of, of possibly of having diversity of opinion around that table? So when you start to get kind of those top advisors, how an incoming president should view, obviously you don't want people who are extremely oppositional to you, because that, that just causes everything to get mucked up. But how, do, how should an incoming president think about people who haven't necessarily been in lockstep with them on everything? Well, my thought about my uh, experience watching, observing in the White House, uh, the pursuit of diversity and use of diversity of opinions and attitudes and politics was they first of all have to be consistent with the president's uh, views of uh, on um, with Norman Natter who came in as Secretary of Transportation on transportation matters. Uh, of somebody's, if they wanted the Interior Department role of transportation matters, I mean, uh, interior, interior yeah. matters. Um, the president, um, you want people who are a part of, into your agenda, agenda, but the president has to communicate in thought, word, and deed that he expects pushback. Well, you, have you thought about this? You know, be careful about this. He has to demonstrate in a meeting or two, maybe suggest that somebody come at him strong to demonstrate to the, maybe somebody that he'd served with at the state level, and Bush had several of those in the White House, so he could demonstrate for the other people that were new working around this president, uh, that he gets, he's comfortable getting pushback, he's comfortable having uh, differences of opinion expressed and working through, and comfortable mm -hmm. with a good, vital communication about, between parties about what to do going forward. And so he sets the example, and if, and if he doesn't do that, he's not gonna get it. Is, is it hard to, when, when you're actually talking to these people about possibly nominating them or bringing them in, depending on the position, to sense whether they are going to be willing to be honest? Assume the president's done that and has created that environment. I would think that there's still going to be certain people who are not going to want to take that step and, and, and possibly challenge the president on, on a particular issue just because you're talking about the president. Well, at least in private. Well, you, the approach that should be taken at all times in helping a president put his team, him, his or her team together. It's helped the, this is the president's, President Bush's charge to me, both at the state level and federal levels. You find the people that will best do the work that we, our administration wants done, and I'll make sure the political affairs people make sure we don't do, do anything stupid politically. So we were looking for the best people. And that means, uh, so then you look at their track record, and, and they, nobody has an easy um, road to get to be successful by the time they're ready for consideration for a federal uh, appointment. So you look at, have they had tough times? Have they had, were they told no by a state legislature? Were they told no by a community? Were they told no by the board of directors or whatever? And were they able to work through it? And were they able to take no or take yes and turn a yes left into a yes right or, or vice versa? Have they had diversity? Have they got experience of taking a divided uh, group of people and then bringing them together around a new idea? As opposed to just implementing, uh, for, you know, in a sort of a, automatic fashion what the president or what the head person has to do. Or do they have experience dealing where there's a lot of pushback? Because there's a lot of pushback by design, be it via the Constitution, in our form of government. Uh, Senator Corker, I'm curious, going back to something you would said earlier about kind of getting the ball rolling, not necessarily today, not saying Clinton people should call you today, but th there's been some talk in the last week or two, at least reports, that, that Trump might lay out at least some top-level cabinet yeah. folks. 
sh is that what the two candidates, should they do that? Is there, obviously that opens up all sorts of scrutiny by the yeah. press, but should they be doing that in the next couple of weeks? I think in, uh, in Trump's case it's more important because he's coming from the outside and I think people want to get a sense of the type of people that he's gonna put in place. Secretary Clinton's been around government for a long time, obviously has a deep understanding of how government works, so in his case, um, I think they are going to do that. Actually, he did that with the Supreme Court nominees, and I think that sometime over the course of late July or August, they'll lay out a group of people. Uh, you're right, it's very problematic to name a person. There's an ethics issue there. I think, I think it's I think, illegal. Yeah, that's right. I think, uh, I think President Small Bush point. wanted to name Colin Powell and let people know he was going to be a Secretary of State, but they realized that was not possible. But you can list a host of people. These are the kinds of folks. And list the one you really want first. That's, that's right. right. That's right. The types of people or the, yeah, whatever. Yeah. 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 So, you know, part of what this is supposed to be about, our, our discussion is supposed to be the kind of what private sector CEOs can teach. And, we, and we've got some, a bunch of folks up here. You started in the private sector, obviously. You're in the private sector now. Uh, you, I, I wonder, I want to talk a little bit about what is the same and, and what is different. Drew, for you, what's the biggest difference between somebody who's going in to become president as the video I think before I said, you know, in charge of you know, the largest organization in the world in terms of people. What's the biggest difference between becoming president though and becoming CEO of say a Fortune 10 company? Yeah, but, um, I'll pick up on a point that you make, Clay, which is the sheer scale of the transition itself is just you know orders of magnitude more complicated than just the sheer scale. I would also you know add two things. You know that's one. I think the other thing is just the the intensity and the scrutiny um, is qualitatively different from having counseled CEOs through like Fortune 100 transitions. That's a huge transition for them and their families. But I think that uh, you know the magnitude of the change and the scrutiny that um, individuals go through to the presidency is probably unlike anything else you know, in the United States. But Dan, uh, for me, I think clearly the biggest difference is CEOs, almost everybody they have to deal with is in their chain of command. Yeah. And they tell them what to do. Or they tell them to get the hell out of here. Right. Uh, and by the way, that's what I think you're supposed to do with people who don't challenge your back. It's just you need you got the wrong person. But the governor, the president, they have to lead a lot of people who don't report to them, who don't work for them, who don't have to do anything the president says. And the military is a term called meta leadership. And for many business people, it, it is peculiar to start trying to deal with legislators don't report to you, not in your party, mayors don't report to you, all sorts of different people, federal people, uh, if you're a governor. I think that is probably the biggest difference between the business leader and the executive in the, in the, uh, in the government. Do you think that means that, that if Donald Trump wins, he's gonna have a bigger culture shock than Hillary would have if she wins? Hillary's been in this culture since God was right. a boy. I mean, she, 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 we can. I think before that, before that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, you know, she is the ultimate insider of government. Yeah. I mean, she's really been, been here for a long, long, long time. Of course, it'll be a culture shock for Trump. Uh, there's no question about that. However, uh, a lot of people make that transition because of their leadership style. You know, I, I can remember Newt Gingrich telling me the night the House voted to impeach Bill Clinton, Clinton called Newt on the phone to talk about a legislative issue. Now, you got that kind of ability to deal. I mean, th th that's the kind of stuff you have to learn. Mm -hmm. and, and if I could, yeah, sure. I mean, the American people are kind of looking for culture shock right now because they don't like the way Washington's working. Um, so, um, I, what I tell business people, if I could, they, they're, they're always complaining, obviously, about our lack of ability to get things done. And they ask, by the way, why we even choose to do these kind of things after, you know, you've been successfully uh, in business. The thing I tell them is this, if business is, of course, public companies are a step closer to, to government, right, versus a private company. But business is two-dimensional in many ways and I think the public sector adds a third dimension. Haley described part of it but it's it's very different in that you've got to persuade people 
uh, that are not in your chain of command. It's not just, by the way, the mayors and the governors that you're referring to, but the American people. And you're constantly under scrutiny, I mean, every day. It's, uh, so I, I think it is more difficult. But also think that uh, people can come in from the outside, and Washington does need a shakeup right now. And even though there may be some glass broken in the process, um, let's face it. I mean, we need to make this government more responsive to the American people. Go ahead. I remember uh, I'm not a political person, and I, I remember uh, being frustrated that we couldn't get something done with Congress on management matters, and. And President Bush would say, Clay, get over it. Read the Constitution. It's supposed to work this way. Just get over it. I mean, that, all those 435 of these and 100 of those, they want to know what your program is going to, how it's going to appeal to their voters. And until you can explain that for them, to them, they're not for it. The other thing that strikes me about uh, the difference between business and this is there's the scope of, of the activity uh, that the President deals with. I mean, it's from health to science to rockets to international this and that and and way more complex way more and so you'll know nothing about it so you have to be you can't wing it you're going to have to absorb information you have to take it in you have to have confidence in your advisors it's more of a team decision making process i would bet than almost any other kind of ceo kind of world the other thing the nature of the presidency the president of dealing is the most important job i hear people say is his role as commander in chief well in that role you are making decisions that put our military in harm's way, or if you're the head of Homeland Security, you are making decisions that was got to be really good at getting our populace out of harm's way. And no CEO faces that. The other thing was I reminded of a comment, Andy Card, who's a really wise soul and very, been around White Houses and two different administrations prior to Bush. He used to tell us in the White House, um, he said the most valuable asset in the world is the U.S. president's time and voice. Not in D.C., not in the United States, in the world. The president can say seven words and markets move or people go to war or, you know. And so all of a sudden now, just the management of how the president, the CEO of our country, spends his time and every word he uses in Everything hangs on that. It's so very important that uh, no CEO has had to master that, understand that, and, and deal with that, that challenge. You, you mentioned Andy Card, and, and there was an analogy, and this is going to be strained, but there was an analogy I was thinking about, which is a Facebook analogy, the company, not, not the product, where, where you've got a founder CEO who is, the, who is the, the visionary behind it. He's the guy who came up with it. He's the guy who drives it. But after a couple of years, the investors said, we need someone who actually knows how to manage things a little bit better than you. So they bring in Sheryl Sandberg, who's, who's kind of, they called her the adult because he was in his 20s. Most pre you know, no president's going to be in their 20s. But I'm curious, is, is the chief of staff that adult from your perspective? And I don't mean to belittle whoever becomes the president, but the president is the vision. The president is the person driving policy. But it, from, is chief of staff, from your perspective, that I believe the chief of staff person? in the White House is the person that determines whether the White House runs well or not. I believe the chief of staff, with the president's concurrence, is the one who should assemble the staff around the president, getting his ideas and so forth. The president, and he's the one that then sets the tone and what the president should expect. And every time he has a briefing, every time he goes to bed, every time he eats, every time he travels, here's how it's going to do. Getting the input from the from the president and the first lady, the communicating that effectively to the staff so that they deliver on that expectation. It's the chief of staff. Uh, Senator, you talked about the when when business folks come to you and say, you know, why can't you move faster? Why can't you get things done? Can you reverse it for a second? If you were to retire tomorrow but decide to go back into business, what do you think you would take from your legislative experience or from your public sector experience that would make you a better business person? I think that uh, this is probably not the answer you thought I would give, but I think that, um, look, I lived in a world, I built shopping centers around our country. I started at age 25. and. My first experience as Commissioner of Finance for our state increased my vision. I was out of the public, uh, private sector, in the public sector. My next round, the, the, my vision was much, much larger. I think if I were to go back in business now at this age, uh, just the scope of what I would look at accomplishing in the business world would be far, far greater. Meaning that I think the public sector is such a broadening experience and 
you touch so many things, your capabilities are expanded in so many ways in your knowledge and your relationships. So what I would do is something far bigger in all likelihood if I still had the energy for that than anything I've done before just because of the the opportunities to know things that uh, be, being a senator for nine and a half years as I've been is a PhD every single day. I mean we're not dealing quite directly with what Clay just laid out but you think about all the things that are before us every single day. I also know that uh, we've got an outstanding chief of staff Todd Womack who's sitting over there watching from the side. Um, I think that um, really relying uh, so much more fully on talented people and bringing them in and giving them room to run. I would do so much, much more so than I did in my first two careers in business. But staff is, is critical. Yeah. I mean, this is a gigantic job. But nobody can fool with all the, and having a strong staff, trust your staff, and your staff trust you. You know, your staff is, uh, they gotta be willing to tell you when they think you're wrong or particularly to tell you something that hadn't worked out like we thought it would. Because that just happens, yeah. particularly you do something like Katrina. Okay. But uh, I don't know anybody in politics that ever made it by himself. Do you think campaigns are good, for, particularly for somebody who's coming, somebody say like Trump, who's coming into politics without having been in politics or elected office before, are campaigns a good training ground for that? You're obviously running an organization, a different type of organization than your own. Is that a, is that a good apprenticeship? Could be. Could be. I'm not a political person, but I'd say no. Politics, in my understanding, is it's me versus you. That's not what governance is. That's true. That's true. Uh, we can open it up for some questions if we have them. If not, I got more. If we have none. Yeah, over there. There's a fellow there. there uh, Mike's coming over to you. Thanks. Um, I was Whoa. Loud mic. Um, I was going to ask actually that exact same question, but kind of a different take on it, which is in terms of how well a campaign is run and sort of what we see about their process, how much can we read into their management style perhaps, or other sort of insights into the, what their management of the executive branch would be like, what can we take away from that? You know, I, first of all, the, the candidate's job is not to run the campaign. I mean, I don't know if you've ever gone on the racetrack, but the candidate is the horse and the jockey is the campaign manager and if you if you ever see the horse turn back and say move to the inside uh, then the horse ain't doing his job so uh, it, be careful about how campaigns are managed uh, I thought Reagan Reagan was my boss I ran a political office of the White House I thought he was a fantastic president hugely successful but I, he no more tried to run his campaign than a man the moon Ann was around. She knows that. We have others? Yeah, right there. So we've talked a lot about having people that the candidates trust within their inner circle as they're coming into the transition, but I was wondering, is it more important, you think, in terms of defining those people? Is it important to have people that have already exhibited that spirit of sort of reaching across the aisle, or is it important to have people that the candidate and the president then trusts and tell them to reach across the aisle. And how do you find sort of the ideal balance between those two? Senator, want to try that? I didn't quite catch the question. The uh, it's important for the sure. candidate to have what kind of people? So is it more important to have people that have sort of already exhibited that spirit of reaching across the aisle, but maybe people that the candidate doesn't know as well already, or is it more important to have people that the candidate already trusts who maybe don't have the same sort of experience of reaching across the aisle, and what influence can the candidate or the future president then have in telling that person to become someone that maybe reaches across the aisle and has You know, unquestionably there's great value in having smart, talented people from outside who bring new perspectives that, that help leaven your administration, but you got to have some people who understand how the government works and can help you put the best together. So I think it's a good administration is a combination of those, in my opinion. But and I do think that when they when you look at someone, you don't just look at the knowledge and experience; you look at their temperament. And you want people who have the type of temperament to be able to work with others, but. 
you look, the, the chief executive, the president's going to set the tone relative to the reaching across the aisle. I mean, they're going to, uh, for and and hopefully any president who comes in understands it's very different. It's very difficult to get things done as a partisan. You've got to begin the process reaching across the aisle. And while you know campaigns are a lot about consolidating your base, right? As you're going through the campaign process, I would think immediately a a new president and let's say Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Homeland Security. I would think as those people, they're immediately beginning to reach across the aisle and, and work with folks. It has to occur in the way our government is set up. Clay, did you want to say something? Uh, I, just, I would bet that of the top, of the top 400 people, uh, Senate confirmed people that the pre President Bush appointed, I bet he had never laid eyes on or heard of 200 of them. <laughs> but he, through us, the Department of Presidents and Personnel, heard really good things said about them from people that he knew and respected. Does that become really, really uh, uncomfortable if one of them doesn't turn out to be uh, what you thought he was going to be? I mean, for you. It never happened. Never happened? <laughs> Out of 200, that's a pretty good batting average. That's not it's a, but, but Clay, you, you also had a relationship with the president and a deep relationship with the president, worked with him while he was governor. You knew the type of people he was looking exactly. for. Exactly. So I, mean, I did the same yeah, thing at yeah, the federal level, right. but I did yeah. for him for four and a half years at the state level. So I knew yeah. exactly what he wanted. To, I knew exactly how he wanted that meeting held. In fact, the very first meeting he held as president with his sta with the staff was with presidents and personnel on Monday after the train after the inauguration on Saturday. And it was as fine a meeting in the in the Oval Office as I bet that's ever been held there for him, because I knew exactly how he wanted it, and it was just. I mean, it was. Yeah. David, I have a question. Uh, the The ability to govern, the ability to set the agenda, depends on uh, mandate. Uh, you all have used that word, mandate. What would a mandate look in t like in 2016? Uh, and what are the consequences uh, growing out of this election uh, of a, the lack of a mandate? What would a lack of a mandate look like? What would a mandate look like? David just kind of is the most political person up here. Uh, I think you're going to find out the answer to that question because I think this is going to be the most negative presidential campaign that's been run in any of our lifetimes. Uh, I think that the Clinton people are going to follow in Barack Obama's campaign against Mitt Romney where the whole theme of the campaign was not, some of us remember it's morning again in America, you remember Reagan ran for re-election on the theme it's morning again in America and got 60% of the vote. Obama would, knew he couldn't run on his morning again in America, and their campaign was, what's wrong with Mitt Romney? He's a rich white guy who doesn't care about people like you, doesn't even know anybody like you. He's a vulture capitalist that ships jobs overseas, takes, borrowed that from Gingrich, takes, right? uh, yeah, takes uh, health insurance away from people's wives. He's a quintessential plutocrat married to a known equestrian. And that was <laughs> that was the theme of the whole campaign. I don't know how you this, remember all it's that. It's going to be the same way. I mean, this is going to be incredibly negative campaign. Each one about why the other one ought not to be present. I hate that. But look, that's that's what we're going to see. And so you're, we're going to find out what do you have when there's not even an effort to get a mandate. And remember, President Obama didn't really try to get a mandate in 12 and we have seen very little even attempt to pass much through Congress. Thank you. Can you discuss how what appears to be an added layer of national security in our country is going to affect the first year of the president? Uh, I think uh I think it's going to have a huge effect. Um, you know, the, the fact is that um, at the local levels, I mean, cities or policemen, mayors are concerned, and so a president's going to have to bring the nation together. Um, obviously, we don't want a lot of federal programs that go out. There are things we can do to assist, but really, much of that takes place at the local level. Homeland Security is going to be challenged more than it's ever been challenged because there are new techniques relative to how to create terror in our country and by the way can be done by very low level people as we know so look security um, there is going to be a mandate for security uh, there's no question that that is going to be the case people feel very insecure 
there's going to be some type of mandate for economic issues because I think those are going to be two, the two central focuses in this effort. But between that and then how we deal with ISIS, I mean, the fact is that uh, you know, the country has become isolationist after the, you know, the Iraq and Afghanistan efforts and how a president deals with mobilizing the country around whatever they believe to be the appropriate effort dealing with ISIS is going to be very, very important. So it, it's going to be a central issue going into January. Drew, can I just ask you, I mean, just taking off on that a little bit, and not security per se, but, but kind of some of the, the unexpected events, and it seems in the last two weeks every day has been an unexpected event. But it seems one of the big differences between a, a private sector CEO and president is, while things can come up on a private sector CEO, something with a product, something macroeconomic, a president has to deal with that much, much more often. And I, just your sense, what's the kind of the technique that should be used or the, the outlook to knowing that whatever those first couple legislative priorities are, there's going to be major distractions along the way. I mean, possibly overwhelming distractions along the way. I think that, um, you know, reflecting on some private sector experiences as well as public sector, uh, it is one of those things you can almost certainly bank on that things are going to surprise you. I mean, if you reflect upon the Bush administration, I mean, who would have thought in the first nine months of what of that administration? Remember the incidents of the spy plane in China to started things off, and obviously getting to 9/11. I mean, it, it fundamentally uh, affected, and we live with the with that today. Um, so, I, but I think that one way of stepping back is, yes, you need your vision, you need your agenda, you need to set that. But it comes back to what we've talked about here, which is you set your agenda, but you have to build the team that's resilient and is going to be able to withstand some of those challenges. And also the, the other point that would highlight is an individual leader needs to, you know, we, we put it in our paper, you know, establish their own operating model, that they're gonna be able to stay kind of centered through the challenges ahead. Uh, you know, the f four to eight years of being a president and having to deal with these challenges, um, that individual and that team, that chief of staff has to manage things in a way that that leader is at their best through what will almost be um, inevitably extraordinarily demanding, stressful situations and the kinds of decisions that you highlighted that in essence, no one's prepared for. Um, and so that is part of it, is preparing to be resilient to confront those challenges. Yes. Briefly, I was talking to Bill at lunch about um, the world is such that the first time you meet with your team in the sit room or the Oval Office to deal with a crisis should not be when it's for real. Yeah. And there's very little practicing, or at least sitting in a room, in those rooms, and watching others act through as it happened under Reagan, or act, act through with the dialogue was like, whatever. And then get together with three of the chief of staff and talk, what are we going to do? Well, I guarantee you, here are seven things, Mr. President, you can count on your staff, what's going to do in the first 40, first 40 minutes and first four hours and whatever when this happens. And so you don't have to tell us how, we, you know, this so you're is talking what, about simulations, essentially. Yeah, simple. but the idea is to, don't be, oh my gosh, something extraordinary has happened here, unexpected. No. Expect the unexpected and figure out, talk about it ahead of time, maybe even practice how you're going to work together to deal with these kind of matters. Uh, yeah, time for one more question. Yeah, you. Uh, I feel as though one of the more understated importances in almost every single election is diplomacy and foreign affairs, and especially so in this election because. As we know, it's between a former Secretary of State and a business mogul. Uh, what's the difference that you feel, or all of you feel, between handling rival or competing companies or even allied companies versus handling uh, competing nations or allied nations? Well, I was going to defer yeah, I was to, too. The, well, to the chairman. Yeah. Uh, so, competing companies. Um, Look, you're trying to win a contract, win a bid. It's a, it's a, a lot of times it's somewhat of a zero-sum game, right? Um, uh, in dealing with diplomacy, uh, your interests may not align on a particular issue, but they may align on the next issue. Or you may have several issues that you're dealing with simultaneously that uh, you're aligned with them on some and not aligned on others. So. Being able to compartmentalize, uh, compartmentalize those is a very complex 
thing that we have to do and uh, uh, it's much more difficult than just competing if you will against a company so that's an area where I would get back to what I say to my business friends is you know it's multi-dimensional it's much more difficult and uh, and the other side has a say it's not just when you if you're going after a big contract against another company there's a there's a defined end to that and then you move on to, to the next and in public affairs foreign policy um, the other side has a say continually okay and it continues to evolve and so again far far more complex uh, let me ask one final question, and uh, Governor, I'll ask you, and I, I was going to say, try to take off your uh, GOP hat for a minute. I was going to say red shirt, and then I realized I was wearing a blue one, so I won't, I won't use that. <laughs> um, so I, my final question for you is this. Can you give, from your perspective, one thing in terms of their pr past experience that you think Donald Trump, could, if he becomes elected president, could learn from Hillary Clinton, and one thing you think Clinton could learn from Trump if she's elected? Yeah, to me... The, both of them have to understand that when two-thirds to three-fourths of the people in America think our country's going the wrong direction, we got to do something different. And I, I think a lot of this of differences is actually going back to the way we did before. I mentioned Ronald Reagan with the huge Democratic majorities in the House for the whole eight years he was president, got all sorts of legislation passed. He did great in divided government, and so did Bill Clinton. I mean, Bill Clinton had both houses, Democrat, I mean, Republican majorities the last six years. It was his best six years. Uh, I look at her, and I think she could learn a lot from her husband. I look at Donald Trump, I don't think he could learn much from her. This is a change election. She is the opposite of change. That's not where you ought to look to learn. Fair enough. Uh, I want to thank uh, all my. Oh, yeah, okay. You no, wanted no, no, no. to say you agreed. Okay. Uh, I want to thank all my panelists. Uh, thank you all uh, for coming out this afternoon. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Good job. Man. Got a few thanks to make here too. First, I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, I'm reminded about the friendships and partnerships we've had with every single person on this stage, and it's really quite extraordinary. Um, starting with Governor Barber, who was the co-chair of the Miller Center Commission on your Manufacturing in America, Senator Corker, who traces his roots back to Chattanooga, which the Miller Center does as well. Uh, we're named after a Chattanooga lawyer and businessman, uh, Burkett Miller, and we've been delighted to work with the senator in the past. Um, Drew Erdman, uh, who, as I mentioned earlier, um, is an alumni of the Miller Center Recordings Program, uh, and his CEO, Don Barton, is a good friend of mine, and that's how this whole entire conversation got started quite some time ago. Um, and Dan, uh, oh, I'm sorry, and um, Clay Johnson, who was a participant in the Bush Oral History, which we've been really delighted to be completing, Barbara Perry, the director of our oral history program, the director of presidential studies at the Miller Center, uh, uh, Clay's interview with her really stood out for her, and we were delighted to be able to recruit him. And then finally, Dan Premack, who's CEO. Uh, Alan Murray is uh, one of my bosses on the governing council of the Miller Center, but whose CEO conference back last November was where um, Don Barton and I got together and talked about this very topic, this very paper. Um, and then as Governor Barber and um, Senator Corker both said, the staff, you can't do this without staff. And I want to thank uh, the Miller Center staff in particular, Jeff Chittister and Tony Lucadamo, who run our policy program, who really put all of this together remotely from, you know, a thousand miles away um, with big help from Reed, um, Howard, Barbara, um, and others at home who are watching and promoting this on Twitter and other social media. I really want to thank all of them. And then finally, our partners at the Annenberg Retreat Center, Jeff and Ken Chavez, who are both here as well as other staff. Um, we're delighted at this partnership. We share a commitment to presidential history and presidential future, and uh, it's really been a great start, and we look forward to doing it again next week in Philadelphia. So thanks to you all uh, for coming today.